A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. the visionary company of love its voice an instant in the wind i know not whither hurled but not for long to hold each desperate choice the broken tower by heart crane scene one the exterior of a two-story corner building on a street in new orleans which is named elysian fields runs between the l and n tracks and the river the section is poor but unlike corresponding sections in other american cities it has a rafish charm. The houses are mostly white frame, weathered gray with rickety outside stairs and galleries and quaintly ornamented gables. This building contains two flats, upstairs and down. Faded white stairs ascend to the entrances of both. It is first dark of an evening early in May. The sky that shows around the dim white building is a peculiarly tender blue, almost a turquoise, which invests the scene in a kind of lyricism and gracefully attenuates the atmosphere of decay. You can almost feel the warmth of the Brown River beyond the river warehouses with their faint redolences of bananas and coffee. A corresponding air is evoked by the music of entertainers at a barroom around the corner. This blue piano expresses the spirit of the life which goes on here. Two women are taking the air on the steps of the building. Above the music of the blue piano, the voices of people on the street are heard overlapping. Two men come around the corner, Stanley Kowalski and Mitch. They are about 28 or 30 years old, roughly dressed in blue denim work clothes. Stanley carries his bowling jacket and a red stained package from the butchers. They stop at the foot of the steps. Hey there, Stella, baby. Stella comes out on the first floor landing, a gentle young woman about 25 and of a background obviously quite different from her husband's. Don't holler at me like that. Hi, Mitch. Catch. What? Meat. He heaves the package at her. She cries out in protest, but manages to catch it. Then she laughs breathlessly. Her husband and his companion have already started back around the corner. Stanley, where are you going? Bowling. Can I come watch? Come on. He goes out. Be over soon. Hello, Eunice. How are you? I'm all right. Tell Steve to get him a poor boy sandwich, because nothing's left here. They all laugh. The other woman does not stop. Stella goes out. What was that package he threw at her? She rises from the steps, laughing louder. <laughs> you hush now. Catch what? She continues to laugh. Blanche comes around the corner, currying a valis. She looks at a slip of paper, then at the building, then again at the slip and the building. Her expression is one of shocked disbelief. Her appearance is incongruous to this setting. She is daintily dressed in a white suit with a fluffy bodice, necklace, and earrings of pearl, white gloves and hat, looking as if she were arriving at a summer tea or cocktail party in the garden district. She is about five years older than Stella. Her delicate beauty must avoid a strong light. There's something about her uncertain manner, as well as her white clothes, that suggests a moth. What's the matter, honey? Are you lost? They told me to take a streetcar named Desire and then transfer to one called Cemeteries and ride six blocks and get off at Elysian Fields? That's where you are now. At Elysian Fields? This here is Elysian Fields. <laughs> they mustn't have understood what I wanted. What number are you looking for? Blanche wearily refers to the slip of paper. 632? You don't have to look no further. I'm looking for my sister, Stella Dubois. I mean, Mrs. Stanley Kowalski. That's the party. You just did miss her, though. This, can this be her home? She's got the downstairs here and I got the up. Oh, she's out? You noticed that bowling alley around the corner? I'm not sure I did. Well, that's where she's at, watching her husband bowl. There is a pause. You want to leave your suitcase here and go find her? No. I'll go tell her you come. Thanks. You're welcome. She goes out. She wasn't expecting you? No, no, not tonight. Well, why don't you just go in and make yourself at home until they get back? 
how could I do that? We own this place, so I can let you in. <laughs> she gets up and opens the downstairs door. A light goes on behind the blind, turning it light blue. Blanche slowly follows her into the downstairs flat. The surrounding areas dim out as the interior is lighted. Two rooms can be seen, not too clearly defined. The first one entered is primarily a kitchen, but contains a folding bed to be used by Blanche. The room beyond is a bedroom. Off this room is a narrow door to a bathroom. It's sort of messed up right now, but when it's clean, it's real sweet. Is it? Uh-huh. I think so. So you're Stella's sister? Yes. Uh, thanks for letting me in. Poor nada. As the Mexicans say, poor nada. Stella spoke of you. Oh, yes? I think she said you taught school. Yes. And you're from Mississippi, huh? Yes. She showed me a home picture of your home place, the uh, plantation. Oh, Bell Reeve. A great big place with white columns. Yes. A place like that must be awful hard to keep up. If you'll excuse me, I'm just about to drop. Sure, honey. Why don't you sit down? What I meant to say was that I'd like to be left alone. Oh, I'll make myself scarce in that case. I didn't mean to be rude, but... I'll drop by the bowling alley and hustle her up. She goes out the door. Blanche sits in a chair very stiffly with her shoulders slightly hunched and her legs pressed close together and her hands tightly clutching her purse as if she were quite cold. After a while, she goes to the blind to look out of her eyes and she begins to slowly look around. A cat screeches. She catches her breath with a startled gesture. Suddenly, she notices something half open in the closet. She springs up and crosses to it and removes a whiskey bottle. She pours half a tumbler of the whiskey and tosses it down. She carefully replaces the bottle and washes out the tumbler at the sink, then resumes her seat in front of the table. I've got to keep hold of myself. Stella comes quickly around the corner of the building and runs to the downstairs flat. Blanche! For a moment, they stare at each other. Then Blanche springs up and runs to her with a wild cry. Oh, Stella, 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 the star! She begins to speak with feverish vivacity as if she feared for either of them to stop and think. They catch each other in a spasmodic embrace. Oh, now then, let me look at you. Oh, but don't you look at me, Stella. Oh, no, 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 not till later. Not till I've bathed and rested and, and, and turn that overlight off. Turn that off. I won't be looked at in this merciless glare. Stella laughs and complies. Oh, come back here now. Oh, my baby. Oh, Stella, Stella, the star. She embraces her again. I thought you would never come back to this horrible place. Oh, what am I saying? I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say nice things about it. No, what a convenient location and such. Oh, <laughs> Oh, precious lamb, you haven't said a word to me. You haven't given me a chance to, honey. Oh, well, now, now, you talk. You open your pretty little mouth and talk while I look around for some liquor. I know you must have some liquor in the place. Oh, where could it be, I wonder? Oh, I spy. I spy. She rushes to the closet and removes the bottle. She's shaking all over and panting for breath as she tries to laugh. The bottle <laughs> nearly slips from her grasp. Blanche, you sit down and let me pour the drinks. I don't know... What we've got to mix with maybe coke's in the ice box we can see honey will i oh no no coke honey not with my nerves tonight oh where 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 is uh stanley bowling he loves it they're having a found some soda a tournament oh just water baby to chase it now now don't get worried your sister hasn't turned into a drunkard she's just all shaken up and, and hot and tired and dirty and now you sit down now and explain this place to me what are you doing in a place like this now, Blanche. Oh, I, I'm not going to be hypocritical. I'm just honestly critical about it. Never, never, never in my wildest dreams could I picture. Oh, only Poe, only Mr. Edgar Allan Poe could do it justice. I suppose there's a ghoul haunted woodland of weir. She laughs. No, honey, those are the Ellen N tracks. <laughs> now, seriously, put a joke in aside. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you write me, honey? Why didn't you let me know? Stella carefully <laughs> pours herself a drink. Tell you what, Blanche. Why, that you had to live in these conditions. Aren't you being a little intense about it? It's not that bad at all. New Orleans isn't like other cities. Oh, it's got nothing to do with New Orleans. You might as well say, forgive me, blessed baby. She the suddenly stopped short. The subject is closed. Thanks. During the pause, Blanche stares at her. She smiles at Blanche. Blanche looks down at her glass, which shakes in her hand. You're all I got in the world. And and you're not glad to see me. But Blanche, you know that's not true. No, I'd forgotten how quiet you were. 
You never did give me a chance to say much, Blanche. So I'd just gotten a habit of being quiet around you. Good habit to get into. Oh, you haven't asked me how I happened to get away from the school before the spring term ended. Well, I thought you'd volunteer that information if you wanted to tell me. You thought I'd been fired. <laughs> no, I thought you might have resigned. I was so exhausted by all I'd been through that my, my nerves broke. Nervously tamping cigarette. I was on the verge of lunacy almost. So Mr. Graves, Mr. Graves is the high school superintendent. He suggested I take a leave of absence. I couldn't put all of those details into the wire. She drinks quickly. Oh, this buzzes right through me and feels so good. <laughs> Won't you have another? Oh no, one's my limit. Sure. You haven't said a word about my appearance. You look just fine. Oh, God love you for a liar. Daylight never exposed so total a ruin, but you, you put on some weight. Yes, you're, you're just as plump as a little partridge and it's so becoming to you. Now, Blanche. Oh, yes, yes it is or I wouldn't say. It. You just have to watch around the hips a little. You know, stand up. Not now. No, you hear me? I said stand up. Stella complies reluctantly. Oh, you messy child. You spilled something on your pretty white lace collar. And about your hair. You ought to have cut it in a feather bob with your dainty features, Stella. You, you don't have a maid, do you? No, with only two rooms. It's... What? Two rooms, did you say? This one and... The other one? She laughs sharply. There is an embarrassed silence. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna take just one tiny little nip more, sort of to put the stopper on, so to speak, and then I'll put the bottle away so I won't be tempted. She rises. I want you to look at my figure. She turns around. You know I haven't put on one ounce in 10 years, Stella. I weigh what I weighed the summer you left Belle Reve, the summer that dad died and you left us. It's just incredible, Blanche, how well you're looking. <laughs> but Stella, there's only two rooms. I don't see where you're gonna put me. We're gonna put you in here. What kind of bed is this? One of those collapsible things? She sits on it. Does it feel all right? Oh, wonderful, honey. I, I don't like a bed that gives too much, but there's no door between the rooms. And Stanley, will it be decent? Stanley is Polish, you know. Oh, yes. There's something like the Irish, aren't they? Well, only not so highbrow. They both laugh again in the same way. <laughs> Oh, I brought some nice clothes to meet all your lovely friends in. I'm afraid you won't think they are lovely. Well, what are they like? They're Stanley's friends. Polacks? They're a mixed lot, Blanche. Oh, heterogeneous types. Oh, yes, yes. Types is right. Well, anyhow, I brought some nice clothes and I'll wear them. I guess you're hoping I'll say I'll put up at a hotel, but I am not gonna put up at a hotel. I wanna be near you, I gotta be with somebody. I, I can't be alone because as you must have noticed, I'm, I'm not very well. Her voice drops and her look is frightened. You seem a little bit nervous or overwrought or something. Will Stanley like me or will I just be a visiting in-law, Stella? Oh, I couldn't stand that. You'll get along fine together if you just try not to, well, compare him with other men that we went out with at home. Is he so different? Yes, a different species. In what way? What, what's he like? Uh, you can't describe someone you're in love with. Here's a picture of him. She hands a photograph to Blanche. An officer? A master sergeant in the engineer's corps. Those are decorations. He had those on when you met him. I assure you, I wasn't just blinded by all the brass. Oh, that's not what I... But of course, there were things to adjust myself to later on. Such as his civilian background. How did he take it when you said I was coming? Oh, Stanley doesn't know yet. You, you haven't told him? Look, he's on the road a good deal. Oh, travels? Yes. Good, I mean, isn't it? I can hardly stand it when he's away for a night. Oh, why Stella? When he's away for a week, I nearly go wild. Gracious. And when he comes back, I cry on his lap like a baby. She smiles to herself. I guess that's what is meant by being in love. Stella looks up with a radiant smile. Stella. What? 
I haven't asked you the things you thought I was probably going to ask, and so I expect you to be understanding about what I have to tell you. What, Blanche? Well, Stella, you're going to reproach me. I know that you're bound to reproach me, but before you do, take into consideration that you left. I stayed and struggled, and you came to New Orleans and looked out for yourself. I stayed at Belle Reve and I tried to hold it together. Now, I'm not meaning this in any reproachful way, but all the burden descended onto my shoulders. The best I could do was make my own living, Blanche. I, I know, I know, but you're the one that abandoned Belle Reve, not I. I stayed and I fought for it, bled for it, almost died for it. Stop this hysterical outburst and tell me what's happened. What do you mean fought and bled? What kind of... I knew you would, Stella. I knew you would take this attitude about it. About what? Please. Oh, the loss. The loss. Belle Reeve. Lost, is it? No. Yes, Stella. They stare at each other across the yellow checked linoleum of the table. Blanche slowly nods her head and Stella looks slowly down at her hands folded on the table. The music of the blue piano grows louder. Blanche touches her handkerchief to her forehead. How did it go? What happened? You're a fine one asking me how it went. Blanche! You're a fine one to sit there accusing me of it. Blanche! I, I took the blows in my face and my body. All those deaths, the long parade to the graveyard. Father, mother, Margaret in that dreadful way so big with it it couldn't be put in a coffin it had to be burned like rubbish you came home just in time for the funeral stella and funerals are pretty compared to deaths funerals are quiet the deaths not always sometimes their breathing is hoarse and sometimes it rattles and sometimes they even cry out to you oh, don't let me go even the old sometimes say don't let me go as if you were able to stop them funerals Funerals are quiet with pretty flowers and oh, what gorgeous boxes they pack them away in. Unless you were at the bed when they cried out, hold me. You'd never suspect there was a struggle for breath and bleeding. You didn't dream, but I saw, 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 and you sit there telling me with your eyes that I let the place go. How in hell do you think all that sickness and dying was paid for? Death is expensive, Miss Stella. An old cousin Jessie's right after Margaret's, oh, hers. Why the Grim Reaper had put up his tent at our doorstep, Stella. Belle Reeve was his headquarters. Oh, honey, that's how it slipped through my fingers. Uh, which one of them left us a fortune? Left us a cent of insurance even. Only poor Jessie with 100 to pay for her coffin. That was all, Stella. And I, with my pitiful salary at the school, yes, sit there and accuse me, thinking I let the place go, that I let the place go. Where were you? In bed with your Pollock. Blanche, you be still, that's enough. Where are you going? I'm going into the bathroom to wash my face. Oh, Stella. Well, Stella, you're crying. It does not surprise you. Oh, forgive me. I didn't mean to. The sound of men's voices is heard. Stella goes into the bathroom, closing the door behind her. When the men appear and Blanche realizes it must be Stanley returning, she moves uncertainly from the bathroom door to the dressing table, looking apprehensively toward the door. Stanley enters, followed by Steve and Mitch. Stanley pauses near his door, Steve by the foot of the spiral stair, and Mitch is slightly above them and to the right of them, about to go out. As the men enter, we hear some of the following dialogue. Is that how he got it? Sure, that's how he got it. He had the old weather bird for 300 bucks on a six number ticket. Tell him those things, he'll believe it. Mitch starts out. Hey, Mitch, come here, come back here. Blanche, at the sound of voices, retires to the bedroom. She picks up Stanley's photo from the dressing table, looks at it, puts it down. When Stanley enters the apartment, she darts and hides behind the screen at the head of the bed. Hey, we playing poker tomorrow? Sure, at Mitch's. No, not at my place. My mother's still sick. Okay, at my place. Mitch starts out again. But you bring the beer. Mitch pretends not to hear, calls out, good night all, and goes out singing. Eunice's voice is heard above. Break it up down there. I made spaghetti dish and ate it myself. I told you and phoned you we was playing. Jack's beer. You never phoned me once. I told you at breakfast and phoned you at lunch. Well, never mind about that. You just get yourself home here once in a while. You want it in the papers? More laughter and shouts of partying come from the men. Stanley throws the screen door of the kitchen open and comes in. He is of medium height, about five feet eight or nine, and strongly compactly built. 
animal joy in his being is implicit in all his movements and attitudes. Since earliest manhood, the center of his life has been pleasure with women, the giving and the taking of it, not with weak indulgence, dependency, but the power and pride of a richly feathered male bird among hens. Branching out from this complete and satisfying center are all the auxiliary channels of his life, such as his hardiness with men, his appreciation of rough humor, his love of good drink and food and games, his car, his radio, everything that is his that bears his emblem of the gaudy seafarer. He sizes up women at a glance with sexual classifications, crude images flashing into his mind and determining the way he smiles at them. You must be Stanley. I'm Blanche. Stella's sister? Yes. Hello? Where's the little woman? In the bathroom. Oh. Didn't know you were coming in town. I, uh... Where are you from, Blanche? Why, I live in Laurel. He has crossed to the closet and removed the whiskey bottle. Laurel, huh? Yeah. Yeah, Laurel, that's right. Not my territory. Liquor goes fast in hot weather. He holds the bottle to the light to observe its depletion. Have a shot? No, I rarely touch it. Some people rarely touch it, but it touches them often. <laughs> my clothes are sticking to me. You mind if I make myself comfortable? He starts to remove his shirt. Oh, please. Please do. Be comfortable is my motto. <laughs> it's mine, too. It's hard to stay looking fresh. I haven't washed or even powdered my face, and here you are. <laughs> you know you can catch a cold sitting around in damp things? Especially when you've been exercising hard like bowling is. You're a teacher, aren't you? Why, well, yes. What do you teach, Blanche? English. <laughs> I was never a very good English student. How long are you here for, Blanche? I, I don't know yet. You're shacking up here? I thought I would if it's not inconvenient for you all. Good. Traveling wears me out. Well, take it easy. A cat screeches near the window. Blanche springs up. What's that? Cats. Hey, Stella! Yes, Stanley? Haven't fallen in, have you? He grins at Blanche. She tries unsuccessfully to smile back. There is a silence. I'm afraid I'll strike you as being the unrefined type. I suppose Stella spoke of you a great deal. You were married once, weren't you? The music of the poker rises up faint in the distance. Yes, when I was quite young. What happened? The boy, the boy died. She sinks back down. I'm afraid I'm going to be sick. Her head falls on her arms. Scene two. It is six o'clock the following evening. Blanche is bathing. Stella is completing her toilette. Blanche's dress, a flowered print, is laid out on Stella's bed. Stanley enters the kitchen from outside, leaving the door open on the perpetual blue piano around the corner. What's all this monkey doings? Oh, Stan! She jumps up and kisses him, which he accepts with lordly composure. I'm taking Blanche to Galatoire's for supper and then to a show, because it's your poker night. Well, how about my supper, huh? I'm not going to no Galatoire's for supper. I put you a cold plate on ice. Well, isn't that just dandy? I'm going to try to keep Blanche out till the party breaks up because I don't know how she would take it. So we'll go to one of the little places in the quarter afterwards and you better give me some money. Where is she? She's soaking in a hot tub to quiet her nerves. She's terribly upset. Over what? She's been through such an ordeal. Yeah? Dan, we've lost Belle Reeve. The place in the country? Yes. How? Oh, it had to be sacrificed or something. There is a pause while Stanley considers. Stella is changing into her dress. When she comes in, be sure to say something nice about her appearance. And oh, don't mention the baby. I haven't said anything yet. I'm waiting until she gets in a quieter condition. So? And try to understand her and be nice to her, Stan. From the land of the blue sky water, they brought a captive maid. She wasn't expecting to find us in such a small place. You see, I tried to gloss things over a little in my letters. So? And admire her dress and tell her she's looking wonderful. That's important to Blanche, her little weakness. Yeah, I get the idea. Now let's get back a little to where you said the country place was disposed of. Oh, yes. How about that? Let's have a few more details on that subject. 
it, it's best not to talk much about it until she's calmed down. Oh, so that's the deal, huh? Sister Blanche can't be annoyed with business details right now? You saw how she was last night. Yeah, I saw how she was. Now let's have a gander at the bill of sale. I haven't seen any. Well, she didn't show you no papers? No deed of sale? Nothing like that? It seems like it wasn't sold. <laughs> what in the hell was it then? Given away? Charity? Shh, she'll hear you. I don't care if she hears me. Let's see the papers. There weren't any papers. She didn't show any papers. I don't care about papers. Have you ever heard of the Napoleonic Code? No, Stanley, I haven't heard of the Napoleonic Code. If I have, I don't see what it- Let me enlighten you on a point or two, baby. Yes? In the state of Louisiana, we have the Napoleonic Code, according to which what belongs to the wife belongs to the husband and vice versa. For instance, if I had a piece of property or you had a piece of property, my head is swimming. All right, I'll wait until she gets through soaking in a hot tub and I'll inquire if she is acquainted with the Napoleonic Code. Looks to me like you've been swindled, baby. And when you're swindled under the Napoleonic Code, I'm swindled too. I don't like to be swindled. There's plenty of time to ask her questions later, but if you do now, she'll go to pieces again. I don't understand what happened to Belle Reeve, but you don't know how ridiculous you're being when you suggest that my sister or I or any one of our family could have perpetrated a swindle on anyone else. Then where's the money if the place was sold? Not sold, lost, lost. He stalks into the bedroom and she follows him. Stanley. He pulls open the wardrobe trunk standing in the middle of the room and jerks out an armful of dresses. Open your eyes to this stuff. You think she got them out of teacher's pay? Hush. Look at these feathers and furs. She's come to preen herself in. What is this here? A solid gold dress, I believe. And this one, what's this here? Fox pieces. He blows on them. Genuine fox fur pieces a half mile long. Where are your fox pieces, Stella? Bushy snow white ones, no less. Where are your white fox pieces? Those are inexpensive summer furs that Blanche has had a long time. I got an acquaintance who deals in this sort of merchandise. I'll have him here to appraise it. I'm willing to bet you there's thousands of dollars of stuff here. Don't be such an idiot, Stanley. He hurls the furs on the daybed. Then he jerks open a small drawer in the trunk and pulls up a fistful of costume jewelry. Oh, and what have we here? The treasure chest of a pirate. Stanley! Pearls, ropes of them. What is this sister of yours? A deep sea diver who brings up sunken treasure? Or is she this champion safe cracker of all time? Bracelets of solid gold too. Where are your pearls and your gold bracelets? Shh, be still, Stanley. Uh, and diamonds, a crown for an empress. A rhinestone tiara she wore to a costume ball. What's rhinestone? Next door to glass. Are you kidding? I have an acquaintance that works in a jewelry store. I'll have him here to make an appraisal of this. Here's your plantation or what was left of it here. You have no idea how stupid and horrid you're being. Now close that trunk before she comes out of the bathroom. He kicks the trunk partly closed and sits on the kitchen table. The Walskis and the Dubois have different notions. Indeed they have, thank heavens. I'm going outside. She snatches up her white hat and gloves and crosses to the outside door. You come out with me while Blanche is getting dressed. Since when do you give me orders? Are you going to stay here and insult her? You damn do it and I'm going to stay here. Stella goes out to the porch. Blanche comes out of the bathroom in a satin red robe. Hello, Stanley. Here I am, all freshly bathed and scented and feeling like a brand new human being. He lights a cigarette. That's good. Blanche what? draws the curtains at the windows. Excuse me while I slip into my pretty new dress. Go right ahead, Blanche. She closes the drapes between the rooms. I understand there's to be a little card party where we ladies are not cordially invited. Yeah. Blanche throws off her robe and slips into a flowered print dress. Where's Stella? Out on the porch. I'm going to ask a favor of you in a moment. Oh, what could that be, I wonder? Some buttons in the back. You may enter. He crosses through the drapes with a smoldering look. How do I look? You look all right. Many thanks. Now the buttons. I can't do nothing with them. You men with your big clumsy fingers. May I have a drag on your seat? Have one for yourself. Why, thanks. It looks like my trunk has exploded. Me and Stella are helping you unpack. Well, you've certainly done a fast and thorough job of it. 
Looks like you raided some stylish shops in Paris. <laughs> yes, clothes are my passion. What does it cost for a string of fur pieces like that? Why, those were a tribute from an admirer of mine. Well, you must have had a lot of admiration. Oh, in my youth, I excited some admiration, but look at me now. She smiles at him radiantly. Would you think it possible that I was once considered to be attractive? The looks are okay. I was fishing for a compliment, Stanley. I'm not going for that stuff. What stuff? Compliments about women about their looks. Never met a woman that didn't know if she was good looking or not without being told, and some of them give themselves credit for more than they've got. I once went up with a doll who said to me, I am the glamorous type. I'm the glamorous type. And I said, So what? And what did she say then? She didn't say nothing. Shut her up like a clam. Did it end the romance? It ended the conversation. And that was all. Some men are taken by this Hollywood glamour stuff, and some men aren't. I'm sure you belong in the second category. That's right. I cannot imagine any witch of a woman casting a spell over you. That's right. You're simple, straightforward, and honest. A little bit on the primitive side, I should think. To interest a woman would have to... She pauses with an indefinite gesture. Lay her cards on the table. <laughs> well, I never cared for wishy-washy people. That's why when you walked in here last night, I said to myself, my sister has married a man. Of course, that was all I could tell about you. Well, let's cut the rebot. Stanley, you come out here and let Blanche finish dressing. I'm through dressing, honey. Will you come out then? Your sister and I are having a little talk. Honey, do me a favor. Run to the drugstore and give me a lemon Coke with plenty of chipped ice. Will you do that for me, sweetie? Yes. She goes around the corner of the building. The poor little thing was out there listening to us. And I have an idea that she doesn't understand you as well as I do. All right now, Mr. Kowalski, let us proceed without any more double talk. I'm ready to answer your, all your questions. I have nothing to hide. What is it? There's such a thing in the state of Louisiana as the Napoleonic Code. According to which, whatever belongs to my wife is also mine, and vice versa. <laughs> my, but you have an impressive judicial air. She sprays herself with her atomizer, then playfully sprays him with it. He seizes the atomizer and slams it down on the dresser. She throws back her head and laughs. <laughs> if I didn't know that was you, that you were my wife's sister, I'd get ideas about you. Such as what? Don't play so dumb. You know what. All right. Cards on the table. That suits me. She turns to Stanley. I know I fib a good deal, and after all, the woman's charm is 50% illusion, but when a thing is important, I tell the truth. And this is the truth. I haven't cheated my sister, or you, or anyone else as long as I've lived. Where's the papers? In the trunk? Everything I own is in that trunk. Stanley crosses to the trunk, shoves it roughly open, and begins to open compartments. What in the name of heaven are you thinking? What's in the back of that little boy's mind of yours? That I'm absconding with something? Attempting some sort of treachery on my sister? Oh, let me do that. It'll be faster and simpler. She crosses to the trunk and takes out a box. I keep my papers mostly in this tin box. She opens it. Puts them underneath. He indicates another sheaf of papers. These are love letters, yellowing with antiquity, all from one boy. He snatches them up. She speaks fiercely. Give those back to me. I'll have a look at them first. The touch of your hands insults them. Hey, don't pull that stuff. He rips off the ribbon and starts to examine them. Blanche snatches them away from him and they cascade to the floor. Oh, well, now that you've touched them, I'll have to burn them. What in the hell are they? Blanche is on the floor gathering them up. Poems from a dead boy. I hurt him the way that you would like to hurt me, but you can't. I'm not young and vulnerable that way anymore, but my young husband was, and I... Never mind about that. You just give them back to me. What do you mean by saying you left to burn them? I'm sorry. I must have lost my head for a moment. Everyone has something he won't let others touch because of their intimate nature. She, she now seems faint with exhaustion, and she sits down with a strong box and puts on a pair of glasses and goes methodically through a large stack of papers. Ambler and Ambler, hmm, crab tree, more Ambler and Ambler. What's Ambler and Ambler? 
firm that made loans on the place. It was lost on a mortgage? That must have been what happened. I don't want no ifs, ands, or buts. What about the rest of the papers? She hands him the entire box. He carries it to the table and starts to examine the papers. Blanche picks up a large envelope containing more papers. There are thousands of papers stretching back over hundreds of years affecting Belle Reeve as piece by piece our improvident grandfathers and fathers and uncles and brothers exchanged this land for their epic fornications, to put it plainly. She removes her glasses with an exhausted laugh. The four-letter word had deprived us of our plantation until finally all that was left, and Stella can verify that, was the house itself and about 20 acres of ground, including a graveyard, to which now all but Stella and I have retreated. She pours the contents of the envelope on the table. Here all of them are, all papers. I hereby endow you with them. Take them, peruse them, commit them to memory even. <laughs> I think it's a wonderfully fitting that Belle Reeve should finally be this bunch of old papers in your big, capable hands. <laughs> I wonder if Stella's come back with my lemon coke. She leans back and closes her eyes. I got a lawyer acquaintance who will study these out. Present them to him with a box of aspirin tablets. You see, under the Napoleonic Code, a man has to take an interest in his wife's affairs, especially now that she's going to have a baby. Blanche opens her eyes. The blue piano sounds louder. Stella? Stella going to have a baby? I didn't know she was going to have a baby. She gets up and crosses to the outside door. Stella appears around the corner with a carton from the drugstore. Stanley goes into the bedroom with the envelope in the box. The inner room fades to darkness and the outside wall of the house is visible. Blanche meets Stella at the foot of the steps to the sidewalk. Stella, Stella for star. How lovely to have a baby. Oh, it's all right. Everything's all right. I'm sorry he did that to you. Oh, I guess he's just not the type that goes in for jasmine perfume. But maybe he's what we need to mix with our blood now that we've lost Belle Reeve. We've, we've, we've thrashed it out and, and I feel a bit shaky, but I think I handled it nicely. I, I laughed and treated it all as a joke. Stephen Paul appeared carrying a case of beer. I called him a little boy and I laughed and flirted. <laughs> yes, I was flirting with your husband. As the men approach. The guests are gathering for the poker party. The two men pass between them and enter the house. Which way do we go now, Stella? This way? No, this way. She leads Blanche away. <laughs> the blind are leading the blind. <laughs> a tamale vendor is heard calling. Red hot. Scene three, the poker night. There is a picture of Van Gogh's of a billiard parlor at night. The kitchen now suggests that sort of lurid nocturnal brilliance, the raw colors of childhood spectrum. Over the yellow linoleum of the kitchen table hangs an electric bulb with a vivid green glass shade. The poker players, Stanley, Steve, Mitch, and Paul wear colored shirts, solid blues, a purple, a red and white check, a light green, and they are men at the peak of their physical manhood, as coarse and direct and powerful as the primary colors. There are vivid slices of watermelon on the table, whiskey bottles, and glasses. The bedroom is relatively dim with the only light that spills between the portiers and through the wide window on the street. For a moment, there is an absorbed silence as the hand is dealt. Anything wild to steal? Well, I'm Jackson Wild. Uh, give me two cards. You, Mitch? I'm out. One? Anyone want a shot? Yeah, me. Why don't, why don't somebody go to the Chinese place on the corner and bring back a load of chop suey? When I'm losing, you want to eat? Ante up. Openers? Openers. Get your ass on the table, Mitch. Nothing belongs on a poker table with cards, chips, and whiskey. He lurches up and tosses some watermelon rinds on the floor. Kind of on your high horse, ain't you? How many? Give me three. One. I'm out again. I ought to go home pretty soon. Shut up. I got a sick mother. She don't go to sleep until I come in at night. Then why don't you stay home with her? She says to go out, so I go, but I don't enjoy it. All the while, I keep wondering how she is. Oh, for the sake of Jesus. Go home, then. What you got? Babe Flush. You all are married, but I'll be alone when she goes. I'm going into the bathroom. Hurry back and we'll fix you a sugar tit. Oh, go run. He crosses through the bedroom into the bathroom. Uh, seven cards stud. Uh, 
this old farmer is out in back of his house, sitting down, throwing corn at the chickens, when all at once he hears a loud cackle. And this young hen comes lickety spread around the house with the rooster right behind her and getting on her fast. Deal. But when the rooster catches sight of the farmer throwing corn, he puts on the brakes and lets the hen get away and starts pecking corn. And the old farmer says, Lord God, I hope I never gets that hungry. <laughs> Steve and Paul laugh. The sisters appear around the corner of the building. The game is still going on. How do I look? Lovely, Blanche. I feel so hot and frazzled. Uh, wait till I powder before you open the door. Do I, do I look done in? Why, no, you're as fresh as a daisy. Oh, one that's been picked a few days. <laughs> Stella opens the door and they enter. Well, 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 I see you boys are still at it. Where you been? Blanche and I took in a show. Blanche, this is Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Hubble. Please don't get up. Nobody's going to get up, so don't be worried. How much longer is the game going to continue? So we're ready to quit. Oh, poker, so fascinating. Could I convince? You could not. Why don't you women go up and sit with your niece? Because it's nearly 2.30. Blanche crosses into the bedroom and partially closes the- Can you call it quits after one more hand? A chair scrapes. Stanley gives a loud whack of his hand on her thigh. That's not fun, Stanley. The men laugh. Stella goes into the bedroom. Makes me so mad when he does that in front of people. I think I will bathe. Again? My nerves are in knots. Is the bathroom occupied? I don't know. Blanche knocks. Mitch opens the door and comes out, still wiping his hands on a towel. Oh, good evening. Hello. He stares at her. Blanche, this is Harold Mitchell, my sister, Blanche Dubois. <clears throat> uh, how do you do, Miss Dubois? How is your mother now, Mitch? About the same, thanks. Uh, she appreciated your sending over that custard. Uh, excuse me, please. He crosses slowly back into the kitchen, glancing back at Blanche and coughing a little shyly. He realizes he still has the towel in his hands and with an embarrassed laugh, hands it to Stella. Blanche looks after him with a certain interest. That one seems superior to the others. Yes, he is. I thought he had sort of a sensitive look. His mother is sick. Is he married? No. Is he a wolf? What Blanche? <laughs> I don't think he would be. What does he do? She's unbuttoning her blouse. He's on the precision bench in the spare parts department at the plant Stanley travels for. Is that something much? No, Stanley's the only one of his crowd that's likely to get anywhere. What makes you think that Stanley will? Look at him. Well, I've looked at him. Then you should know. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I haven't noticed the stamp of genius even on Stanley's forehead. She takes off the blouse and stands in her pink silk brassiere and white skirt in the light through the portieres. The game has continued in undertones. It isn't on his forehead and it isn't genius. Oh, well, what is it and where? I would like to know. It's a drive that he has. You're standing in the light, Blanche. Oh, am I? She moves out of the yellow streak of light. Stella has removed her dress and put on a tight blue satin kimono. You ought to see their wives. <laughs> I can imagine big beefy things, I suppose. You know that one upstairs? <laughs> one time, the plaster <laughs> cracked. You had to cut out that conversation in there. You can't hear us. Well, you can hear me and I said to hush up. This is my house and I'll talk as much as I want to. Now, Stella, now don't start a row. He's half drunk. I'll be out in a minute. She goes into the bathroom. Blanche rises and crosses leisurely to a small white radio and turns it on. All right, Mitch, you in? What? Uh, oh, no, I'm out. Blanche moves back into the streak of light. She raises her arms and stretches as she moves indolently back to the chair. Room of music comes on over the radio. Mitch rises at the table. Who turned that on there? Well, I did, do you mind? Turn it off. Ah, uh, let the girls have their music. Sure, that's good, leave it on. Sounds like Xavier Cougat. Stanley jumps up and crossing to the radio turns it off. He stops short at the sight of Blanche in the chair. She returns his look without flinching. Then he sits again at the poker table. The two men have started arguing hotly. I didn't hear you name it. Didn't I, I name it, Mitch? I wasn't listening. What were you doing then? Just looking through them drapes. He jumps up and jerks roughly at the curtains to close them. Now deal the hand over again and let's play cards or quit. So people get ants when they win. 
Mitch rises as Stanley returns to his seat. Sit down. I'm going to the head. Deal me out. Sure, he's got ants now. Five dollar bills in his pockets, folded as tight as spitballs. Tomorrow you'll see him at the cashier's window, getting them changed into quarters. When he goes home, he'll deposit them one by one in a piggy bank his mother gave him for Christmas. The game is spit in the ocean. Mitch laughs uncomfortably and continues through the courtiers. He stops just inside. Hello. The little boy's room is busy right now. We've been drinking beer. Oh, I hate beer. It's a hot weather drink. Oh, I don't think so. It always makes me warmer. Have you got any cigs? She has slipped on the dark red satin wrapper. Sure. Oh, what kind are they? Luckies. Oh, good. What a pretty case. Is it silver? Yes, yes. Uh, read the inscription. Oh, there is an inscription. I, I can't quite make it out. He strikes a match and moves closer. Oh. Reading with feigned difficulty. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Oh, why, that's from my favorite sonnet by Mrs. Browning. You know it? Oh, I certainly do. There's a story connected with that inscription. Mm, sounds like a romance. A pretty sad one. Oh? The girl's dead now. Oh. She knew she was dying when she gave me this. Very strange girl. Very sweet. Very. She must have been fond of you. Sick people have such deep, sincere attachments. That's right, they do. They certainly do. <laughs> Sorrow makes for sincerity, I think. Sure brings out brings it out in people. The little there is belongs to people who have experienced some sorrow. I believe you are right about that. I'm positive I am. Show me a person who hasn't known any sorrow and I'll show you a superficial. Listen to me, my tongue's a little thick. <laughs> you boys are responsible for it. The show let out at 11 and we couldn't come home on account of the poker game, so we had to go somewhere and drink. I'm not accustomed to having more than one drink. Two is the limit, and and three. <laughs> Tonight I had three. <laughs> Mitch, uh, deal me out. I'm talking to Miss uh, Dubois. Uh, Miss Dubois. It's a French name. It means woods, and Blanche means white. So the two together mean white woods, like an orchard in spring. You can remember it by that. You're French. We are French by extradition. Our American ancestors were the French Huguenots. You are Stella's sister, are you not? Uh, yes, Stella is my precious little sister. I, I, I call her little in spite of the fact that she's somewhat older than I. Oh, just slightly, less than a year. Uh, will you do something for me? Sure, what? I bought this adorable paper-colored lantern at the Chinese shop in Bourbon. Will you put it over that ball, will you please? Be glad to. Oh, I can't stand a naked light bulb any more than I can a crude remark or a vulgar action. Mitch adjusts the lantern. I guess we strike you as being a pretty rough bunch. I'm very adaptable to circumstances. Well, that's a good thing to be. You are visiting Stanley and Stella? Well, Stella hasn't been so well lately, and I, I came down to help her for a little while. She's very run down. You're not... Very? Oh, no, I'm an old maid school teacher. You may teach school, but you're certainly not an old maid. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your gallantry. So you are in the teaching profession? Yes, uh, yes. A grade school or a high school or... Bitch! Uh, coming! Oh, gracious, what lung power. <laughs> I teach high school in, in Laurel. What do you teach? What subject? Yes. Uh, I bet you teach uh, art or music. <laughs> uh, of course, I could be wrong. You might teach arithmetic. <laughs> never arithmetic, sir. Never arithmetic. <laughs> oh, I don't even know my multiplication tables. No, I have the misfortune of being an English instructor. I attempt to instill a bunch of bobby soxes and drugstore Romeos with a reverence for Hawthorne and Whitman and Poe. I guess that some of them are more interested in other things. <laughs> How very right you are. Their literary heritage is not what most of them treasure above all else, but they're sweet things. 
And in the spring, it's touching to notice them making their first discovery of love, as if no one had ever known it before. The bathroom door opens and Stella comes out. Blanche continues talking to Mitch. Oh, have you finished? Oh, wait, I'll turn on the radio. She turns the knobs on the radio and it begins to play Vienne, Vienne, Nur de Alain. Blanche waltzes to the music with romantic gestures. Mitch is delighted and moves in awkward imitation like a dancing bear. Stanley stalks fiercely through the portieres into the bedroom. He crosses to the small white radio and snatches it off the table. With a shouted oath, he tosses the instrument out the window. Drunk, drunk, you animal thing, you! She rushes through to the poker table. All of you, please go home. If any of you have any spark of decency in you. Stella, watch out, he's- Stanley charges after Stella. Then take it easy. You lay your hands on me and I'll- She backs out of sight. He advances and disappears. There is the sound of a blow. Stella cries out. Blanche screams and runs into the kitchen. The men rush forward and there is grappling and cursing. Something is overturned with a crash. My sister's gonna have a baby! This is terrible. Oh, lunacy! Absolute lunacy! Get him in here, men. Stanley is forced, pinioned by the two men, into the bedroom. He nearly throws them off. Then all at once he subsides and is limp in their grasp. They speak quietly and lovingly to him, and he leans his face on one of their shoulders. I want to go away. I want to go away. Poker shouldn't be played in the house with women. Blanche rushes into the bedroom. I want my sister's clothes. We'll go to that woman's upstairs. Where is the clothes? I've got them. She rushes through to Stella. Stella, Stella, precious, dear, dear little sister, don't be afraid. With her arms around Stella, Blanche guides her to the outside door and upstairs. What's the matter? What happened? Just blew your top, Stan. He's okay now. Sure, my boy's okay. Put him on the bed. Get a get a wet towel. I think coffee would do him a world of good now. I want water. Put him in the shower. The men talk quietly as they lead him into the bathroom. Let go of me, you sons of bitches. Sounds of blows are heard. The water goes on full tilt. Let's get quick out of here. They rush to the poker table and sweep their winnings on their way out. Poker should not be played in a house with women. The door closes on them and the place is still. The entertainers in the bar around the corner play paper dolls, oh. slow and blue. After a moment, Stanley comes out of the bathroom dripping wet and still in his clinging wet polka dot drawers. So? There is a pause. My baby dolls left me breaks into sobs. Then he goes to the phone and dials, still shuddering with sobs. Eunice! Well, my baby. He waits a moment, then hangs up and dials again. Eunice, I'll keep on ringing until I talk to my baby. An indistinguishable shrill voice is heard. He hurls the phone to the floor. Dissonant brass and piano sounds the rooms dim out to darkness and the outer walls appear in the nightlight. The blue piano plays for a brief interval. Finally, Stanley stumbles himself half-dressed out onto the porch and down the wooden steps to the pavement before the building. There he throws back his head like a baying hound and bellows his wife's name. So, so, sweetheart, stop! So, quit that howling out there and go back to bed. Well, my baby down here, so, so. She ain't coming down, so you quit or you'll get with the law on you. You can't beat on a woman and then call her back. She won't come, and they're gonna have a baby. You stinker, you whelp of a Polak, you. I hope they do haul you in and turn the fire hose on you, same as last time. Yeah, so I want my girl to come down with me. <laughs> she slams her door. Zah! The low tone clarinet moans. The door upstairs opens again. Stella slips down the rickety stairs in her robe. Her eyes are glistening with tears and her hair loose about her throat and shoulders. They stare at each other. Then they come together with low animal moans. He falls to his knees on the steps and presses his face to her belly, curving a little with maternity. Her eyes go blind with tenderness as she catches his head and raises him level with her. He snatches at the screen door and lifts her off her feet and bears her into the dark flat. Blanche comes out on the upper landing in her robe and slips fearfully down the steps. Where's my little sister? Stella? Stella? She stops before the dark entrance of her sister's flat, then catches her breath as if struck. She rushes down to the walk before the house. She looks right and left, as if for a sanctuary. The music fades away. Mitch appears from around the corner. Miss Dubois? Oh. All quiet on the Potomac now? 
she ran downstairs and, and went back in there with him. Sure she did. I'm terrified. Oh, oh, there's nothing to be scared of. They're crazy about each other. I'm not used to such... It's a uh, shame this had to happen when you just got here, but don't take it serious. Violence! It's so... Get down on the steps and have a cigarette with me. Well, I'm not properly dressed. That don't make no difference in the quarter. Such a pretty silver case. I showed you the inscription, didn't I? Yes. During the pause, she looks up at the sky. There's so oh. much, so much confusion in the world. Thank you for being so kind. I need kindness now. <laughs>